then. Um, well, hello, everybody. Thanks for giving the hour to look at Jonah. It's the usual format, as you've just heard. So why did I offer to look at Jonah as sustenance for us? Well, I guess despite loving God, I've been feeling increasingly angry, I think, with people who aren't telling the truth. My heart had become hard and quite judgmental towards others for the things they're doing wrong, but also for things they're failing to do. And I guess my faith didn't seem to scratch where the itch was or the complexity of it. And I've always felt drawn to Jonah. So this is a man who didn't want to have anything to do with God's calling. It's too hard. It's wrong what you've asked me to do. I won't do it. How can God let evil people off the hook? Is that what God's doing in Jonah? So we know as Christians, we're told to love, forgive, yes, have mercy. But to be honest, I struggle over the climate disaster, if I'm honest, because I fear that forgiveness and mercy may mean that I act with even less urgency because anger seems to kickstart me in a way that love doesn't. So how do I hold all that together? And alongside this, obviously, I love deeply. I pray. I believe in contemplative practices. So my heart went uh, searching for a salve or a softener. And I turned to Jonah because he had those three long, dark days to contemplate, pray, and ultimately to face himself. So I wanted to see what he might have to offer me um, in those beautifully constructed tiny pages. And I'm going to share the treasure today and take from it what you will. So people say of Jonah, oh, he's the guy who got swallowed by the whale because he disobeyed God. But is that actually what we think? And I grew up with a surface children's church reading of Jonah. So if you're naughty and you disobey God, he will chase you down. But equally, if you're naughty and mess it up, well, he will he will kind of rescue you. So we've equally made it this re reductionist, individualistic moral fable. But if you poke a little bit below the watery surface, there is a scandal in God's ask. OK, and it's right there. And I found my friend David Benjamin Blower's book, Sympathy for Jonah, and I opener, and I'm leaning very heavily on that today and I think he nails the horrific truth of the book when he says this the grace of God is awful to us because the proper response to evil is to fear it to desire its destruction not to love it and desire its redemption so I, at least I found that my anger is logical it's good to know but not apparently the best response because if humanity is to survive the murderous way that empires run then evil people need to be turned around hence we sit on the tarmac we hold placards vigils amongst many other things and God is focused on dismantling the evils of empire. So Jonah is very relevant. So let's take a closer look together. Okay, Jonah, one of the 12 minor Jewish prophets, lived 785 years before Christ in the Northern Kingdom. Two kings is the only other time we meet him. And I think this is a great little passage because it implies that Jonah had a hand in border control with the Aramaeans to the north. Okay, so they lived between Israel and the Assyrians. And he was the boundary keeper, it implies. Maybe that's why the task was so hard, right? Because he was asked to disregard his life's work. So instead of keeping people out, you're now supposed to go over and find God's image in the other. And he's not treated with much kindness through history. I mean, check out any commentators. And they say that he was selfish, that he didn't understand God, that how could he be so stupid as to try to run away? Um, he is actually the only prophet who turns down the divine calling. So why did he turn that, uh, God down? I mean, why? Over the years, an idea formulated, and it has subtly and firmly stuck, that he was racist, that he didn't want God to redeem the Gentiles. If you don't believe me, go and check out the Encyclopedia Britannica and the New International Version, the Study Bible Introduction, which both basically say he represents the Jews, they were jealous and they didn't want to share, which is nowhere to be seen. <laughs> There's not one word that even vaguely means Gentile in the whole book of Jonah, as David Benjamin Blair points out. And his view is that the racism has been kind of shoehorned back in. Um, we know racism against Jews is evidence throughout history. And if you want to go and look, look at Martin Luther's tract, which is called The Jews and Their Lies, to see the depth of antagonism from Christians to Jews. So I believe it's been shoehorned back in. And this is the weird thought process that we'd have to historically shove back into Jonah's brain. OK, here we go. I hate Gentiles, so I'm not going to go. Oh, hang on, wait. I know what I'll do. I'll take a boat full of Gentile sailors towards a Gentile populated land where I'll be the only Jew among Gentiles all day till I die with no way of worshipping or eating or purifying the Jewish way. And the book is actually warm between the Gentile sailors and Jonah. They talk. We can imagine them singing and drinking. He tells them of his argument and the storm comes. We know he's willing to die. They say, don't die. And they do everything to stop that. So Jonah is certainly not the religious bigot that we've been told. So then why did he catch the boat? Well, 
I guess the most obvious reason is the most obvious reason. So let's look at the people in Nineveh. Because the whale is not the biggest beast swimming darkly through the story. Um, the beast lurking is the Assyrian Empire in the north, and their capital was Nineveh. And David Benjamin Blur describes them as Nazis of the ancient day. So they were and still are famous for being the most brutal, savage, and graphically cruel tyrants. And I, I can't stress this um, strongly enough. This is some of the things they did. They skinned people alive in public. They would stick poles up your backside and leave you there alive on show to sort of make a point. They would bury people alive up to their necks and they cut off people's hands and feet for fun. So they were on Israel's doorstep and they put the fear into the bellies of all the surrounding people. They were uniformly hated. Nineveh was hated. Prophet Nahum, amongst others, spoke up against them. But he was at a safe distance, remember, and that was bad enough. And the fear was, what if we fall into their hands? And that's exactly actually what happened to the Jews in the north about 720 before Christ. So this thuggish group of people is who God says, off you go, Jonah. And it's outrageous, all right? It's like asking a Jew in the 1940s to stand before Hitler and say, look, I'm so sorry, but you're wicked in so many ways. Could you just stop doing it? That's the equivalent. And we know that God does love everyone, but it's deeply unsettling to think about his compassion for murderous Assyrians and Nazis. Because it feels all the things I've said at the beginning, I struggle with. It's unjust. It's unfair. It's morally wrong. It's distasteful. So that's what Jonah would have felt. So Jonah had every good reason to take a boat. And, and I think we need to drop the narrative that we would have gone. I heard this all through church. You see, if I had been there, I would have gone. I'm telling you right now, if you told me to go to Putin and tell him to stand his army down and turn from wickedness, I wouldn't go. And if you've been on the news this morning, I would not have the guts to tell Netanyahu or Hamad this morning to stop. I'd run away if I heard that call. So let's be much more kind on who Joan actually was. He was also a man. So a more interesting question to ask is why did they write this story down and include it then in the Hebrew scriptures? Because you've got a prophet who says no to God and you've got a God who says these most vile humans are loved. So it is a miracle is written down. But the outrageous bit is that by the time it was written down, um, the, when the scribe wrote it, Assyria had long since trampled into the northern kingdom, tortured, raped, pillaged, murdered, and taken the northern Israelites away. So this book, showing God's compassion for this terrorist people, should really have been burned, okay? But instead it was selected and canonized as kind of holy Jewish scripture. And in fact, I don't know if you know, but the Jewish people at Yom Kippur open a part of Jonah and they reflect on God's willingness to forgive those who repent, no matter how bad they've been, which I find really challenging. I just think, let's imagine the chat to get the book in, shall we? Shall we put it in? Well, I mean, our ancestors got tortured. I mean, we lost our sense of self and God feels like he abandoned us to them. Oh, yeah, let's put it in. Well, God did ask them to repent, but they killed us all anyway years later. Oh, yeah, let's put it in. I mean, it's bizarre, but it's part of the Jewish tradition, which we're not very good at as Christians, it, of confessing stubbornness, jealousy, and pride. And that's a really good thing in CCA if we can keep ourselves really, really real. So that's why I'm coming to you with my, you know, my arrogance and my pride at the moment. A few more facts about Assyria then to flesh out the situation that Jonah was walking into. So we've got them as a first class mutilators, but also they were the following things. They were the first empire to attempt globalization. So you will all be Assyrian. They were the first to make Assyrians in the conquered lands far away. They imposed their language on conquered lands, which was Aramaic. We know Jesus spoke Aramaic 600 years after the Assyrian empire fell. And they were the first empire to form a standing army. So it wasn't just to a terrifying kind of place that God sent Jonah. It was to an organized systemic machine. Arise, go to Nineveh and cry against it because their wickedness has come up before me. And I think as Christians, we tend to have the wickedness as a kind of a moral failure. It's the sort of thing that, you know, you repent at a Billy Graham mission evening in the 1950s. But David Benjamin Blower says this, I quote him, Jonah was the Hebrew prophet confronting the politics of empire, the diabolical re greed of imperial violence with the entirely different and totally bizarre politics of the kingdom of God, which he himself spends the whole of the rest of the story struggling to make any good sense of. 
so bingo god's compassion is really hard to get our heads around and jonah failed at the end of the book you'll see he's struggling with what on earth it means so who can blame him for fleeing so then we know he's chucked overboard swallowed faces the dark and the fish allows jonah to face himself and god so he prays positive prayers of gratitude bizarrely in the whale's belly now we know darkness and deep hell holes can send us on our knees or they can also equally send us out of our minds. At times we intentionally come close to God and at times all we can do is sit passively with him. That's the extent of our ability. But we have this opportunity in the darkness of 2023 when things seem to be coming undone at the seams. We have this time to face the fear of what is lurking below us, what is coming to snatch us, to come to terms with the fear and potential loss. This time is a gift to us. Like Jonah, we need to surrender maybe to that darkness and allow the gratitude to rise. It's just a thought. But the thought of being in the dark underwater makes me feel physically sick. I do not want to drown. I don't like deep water. I don't like tiny spaces, but I'm fascinated and repulsed by submarines. I don't know if you are the same. The deep ocean is something as land creatures we rightly fear. So the Loch Ness Monster obsession, Jaws, and even just being out of your depth, if you may, don't like it. So Jonah's prayer is crushing and unbearable. And as jo um, David Benjamin Blower says this, Jonah is tragically drowning in his own fault. And the airless death seems to be coming for him. And it's the utter aloneness that makes me shudder. Thankfully, after three days, he's belched up. He's sticky. He's stinking. And it's interesting, the Hebrew for great fish switches from masculine to feminine at this point in the story. There is a rebirth. He is a new man. He's different than when he went in. It's not a simplistic good, bad conversion like we've got in Christianity, but rather this idea of looking in a mirror and being changed. So he's not back at the start. He's moving forward. He's facing his own humiliation that he ran away from God. Humiliation is presented as really good for us. I don't like it, but it's really good for us. And the Jewish tradition are much better because they celebrate that it can draw us closer to God. So it's really good that I own my own mistakes. It's actually vital that we own our own mistakes. OK. Nadia Boltz Weber, the theologian, wrote this week, and I think this is brilliant. The devil doesn't always turn people conspicuously sinister. Sometimes he just turns us blindingly righteous, which frankly is more effective and also more dangerous. Atrocities are more often perpetuated by those of us who are dazzlingly certain of our cause's righteousness. If I want to stand against evil, maybe the best way to do that is to remain sufficiently suspicious of my own virtues. I thought was really helpful. So humiliation can lead to humility, is what we're seeing in Jonah. And the Jewish tradition, literary tradition, makes the center point of the story, the center point of the story, right? Literally in terms of wording. And that's the vomiting. So Jonah's transformation. So our dark days are meant to transform us, friends. So let's not waste the opportunity. Then he lands on the beach 400 miles from Nineveh, which is northern Iraq. He has a very long walk to contemplate how on earth they are going to kill him, for which he thinks they surely will. He enters the city alone, he walks for one day, and then he speaks in a foreign language a word against them. And God has not reassured him, just to underline this, he's not said every little thing is going to be all right at all. So would he be skinned, burned, skewered? Who knows? Jonah says a total of five Hebrew words. He says this, 40 days and then it will be overthrown. No mention of God or what's going to overthrow them, a very short sermon. And the most bizarre thing happens next. Bang, they all repent, the cows included. I like that detail as a vegan. I love that one. A grassroots response right up to the highest level of government. So they all changed their clothes. They all quit eating. They all showed they had turned. But then we are shown the moment that says it all. Jonah did not want Nineveh to repent. He wanted to, them to be dealt with by God as their actions deserved. We think it's unusual. We think I wouldn't be like that. But let's be honest, we don't want paedophiles like Ian Huntley reformed and returned to society. We don't want baby murderers like Lucy Letby to be redeemed and then have her own babies. 
We don't want fossil fuel CEOs to retire and do voluntary work for the elderly. And we don't want Nazis to grow old. And David Benjamin Blower says this great quote, at times, God can be seem to be unrealistic about what can reasonably be redeemed. I don't want fossil fuel boards of directors let off the hook. I don't want Tory ministers let off their corruption. I don't want repentance because no amount of saying sorry seems to be adequate for what they've done and what they're still doing. So I repeat what I said at the start. The grace of God in Jonah is awful to us because the proper response to evil is to fear it and desire its destruction, not to love it and desire its repentance. So Jonah knew God was like to have compassion. After all, God is slow to anger, abounding in love. So not only was he scared for his neck that he would get slit, but he was scared of the power and the call of this enemy love. This book outrageously calls us to enemy love to have loving compassion for monsters seems distasteful in the extreme. Then we know Jonah cuts off the chat with God. I love it. I would rather die than live with this forgiveness. And then he stalks off and sits on a hill in the sun. Stomp, stomp, stomp. And God grows his viney plant, which pleases Noah. And then the worm comes and chomps through it and then kills off Jonah's shade and his good mood. And he says, I'm allowed to be angry with you, God, he says. But God has the last word saying he loves the thousands of people and animals in Nineveh and Jonah is silent, still can't get his head around it. Jonah, according to David Benjamin Blower, is the most progressive story that we will ever read. Because it calls on the powerless and asks them to do nothing less than to practice compassion for the utterly tyrannical despots of empire. Jonah cannot accept the politics being suggested here. The book holds a mirror to us. Can we accept that? Can we accept that politics? Assyria stands in a long line of violent empires. Nineveh is a memorial to them all. God will not leave it unpunished. Even if his anger is slow, sometimes so frustratingly slow, he will bring down the oppressors of every age. By the way, Nineveh was sacked in 612 BC. For anyone receiving brutal imperial aggression, tears and anger calling for destruction is totally understandable which makes the love of God so incredibly hard to swallow in Jonah. God is setting out not to eliminate the enemy, but to turn it round. The book challenges me because it shows that ruthless killers may actually repent and turn to God. Now, I just think, can I imagine, can you imagine anything more than inept government policies causing death and destruction? Can we pray that we change our expectations even in the face of the climate catastrophe? And Richard Raw says this, the great surprise of the Hebrew scripture is that people are not going to get what they deserve. They're going to get much better than they deserve. Love is the only thing that transforms the human heart. If we're honest, we like to see people punished. We like to see people to go to jail to get what they deserve. How different God is from humanity. We don't know God. We don't agree with God and we don't understand God. We think fear, anger, judgment and punishment are going to achieve love. But show me where. And Jesus, interestingly enough, points to Jonah to explain himself. So Jesus marched into the hands of the Romans with no weapons. And his mission was as political as Jonah. And the call from Jonah and Jesus to love with his radical enemy love is terrible. Yet the call stands. So some practical steps. Well, I guess the first step to loving our enemies is to acknowledge them. And I'm going to look at a couple of common enemies I think we have on this call. (laughs) One enemy we share is the neoliberal empire at home, the enemy we live under where we have to consume oil. We have become dangerously comfortable with those suffering out of sight. We also see the enemy in the people who represent the power of our empire that we live in. So we really, guys, need enemy love. It's impossible without it. Now, this is going to really stick in the throat. (laughs) We need to give them grace because they give us grace because we are part of the consumers that demand the environmental rape, wars for resources and child labor, etc. And again, David Benjamin Blower sums it up by saying this, the oppressor is the enemy whose hand we darkly hold and from whose shadow we must ourselves emerge. Another enemy is the foreign enemy, the enemy the media tells us we need to be fearful of. Okay, that's what swims in culture. The other, the, those who live in North Korea, Russia, China, various parts of the Middle East, the Roma gypsies, the travelers, the refugees, but it could simply be someone in the other part of town or a different postcode. 
And if enemy love needs to happen, we need to look to our local area. What can we do for the other? I've decided something I'm going to do. I'm telling you to hold myself accountable to it. I'm going to take my little fold up table, a hot meal, two chairs, a candle and a tablecloth and find the homeless guy that I've had a, some brief conversations with. Not because I'm great, because I'm not, but because I need to go to the other and basically it will stretch me and that will be really good for me. Tolerance is not the same. It is totally different to enemy love, which seeks the image of God in the other. And it's difficult to know where to start, isn't it? Loving Rupert Murdoch, Suella Braverman, Pretty Patel, Vlad, Donald. But we do have local ones waiting for them and to them we must go. Because Jonah, notice, goes to the other with no warm feelings at all. It's only when he, we go over the boundary that the magic begins. So enemy love is only a thing when it's actually done. We can talk about it till we're blue in the face, but it has to be done. And Jonah had badass feelings, but went nonetheless. And that has really affected me over the last few months as I've been studying this. Ched Myers says, after all the heavy breathing we do about God, it's quite simply where one puts one's body that really counts, which is Sue Parfit's brilliant book. If you haven't read it, go read it. I read it. It's fantastic. Above all, how many social barriers do we cross in order to be with Jesus? We need to actually go. Many of you, many of CCA are going. This talk is meant to encourage us to go further up and further in. Personally, I've been feeling God wants me to receive more courage. I cried on my July holiday. I had a very bleak holiday in July, in June. Some of you remember I lay on the floor in this church because of the degradation in the Yorkshire Dales. And that bleak sadness was my latest belly experience of being in the whale. I cried and I just felt like I was rending my clothes. So I feel God has called me to go further up, further in. And the challenge to me is I've now going to join the JSO marching simply because it's a long story of God's presence through you, through friends, through my dog, through my children, through nature, whatever. I know I'm called to walk towards the other. Maybe that's the police, the courts of law, behind them, the big girls and gals. But I'm not offering my neck in solidarity with you, but also um, in vulnerability, as Jonah did. The final point as we, before we come to breakout rooms is this. I want to share about the interruption Jonah causes by saying his five words in the streets. It's called the Janaic interruption. It's the interruption of business as usual. By presenting ourselves, our actual physical presence in vulnerability to the, to the other, which is what you do every time you sit, speak, take on criticism, potential arrest. That's what we're doing. And it's a rupturing in time often seems to happen as well. These interruptions say another world is possible. And as Christians, these interruptions actually say another world is in, it, it absolutely coming. Whether you like it or not, it's a coming. Jonah never mentions God. It was not the five Hebrew words he spoke that changed Nineveh because they couldn't care less, to be honest, about God's or powers anyway. It was that Jonah turned up. He showed God's love in his body. That changed everything. The prophetic act of a man offering his neck in the small hope that he didn't even want, by the way, for redemption. It's like Jonah hands them two ends of a rope that they've been using in a tug of war. And they basically see it for the first time because he's dismantled the rules of the game. And Jesus practice, practices genetic interruptions constantly, constantly ignores rules. And he's constantly captivated. And I'm going to come back to that word in a minute, captivated by the other. Tax collectors, women, Samaritans, sex workers, Gentiles. He ignores the usual setup. He constantly searched for the image of God in the other. Challenge to me, can I be captivated by my Tory MP? Or my far right neighbor? Can I be captivated in that moment? Because this genetic interruption creates a pause which might lead to repentance. Whatever happens, an interruption has occurred, and that's what we have to be faithful to, which is what we're seeking to do along with XR and the others. The cross is the genetic interruption calling for radical social and political change, and we are called to continual acts of interruption. This is what we are all doing in CCA, radical acts of enemy love. So it seems only right to end with a quote from David Benjamin Blower, which is beautiful. One day there will be a genetic interruption and time will stop as it has done before, but it won't start up again. 
all its machinery will be hammered into something good and beautiful or thrown onto the fire. And then we will know that the world to come is finally here. So, Jonah, I've posed you three questions which are going to go in the chat. This is what, obviously don't stick to these if you just want to talk about something that's come up or you want to share, that's also fine. But I think these three questions might bring to the fore something that's important. How can we use this dark time contemplatively? How can we use this dark time contemplatively? How can we process our anger yet love all people? No exceptions, Assyrians included. And how can we in CCA follow in Jonah and Jesus' footsteps by bringing pauses Genaic interruptions. How can we do that? We are doing it. Any more ways we think we can do that? 